Hello and welcome. In this episode, Michael shared his path from the George Washington University and Columbia University School of Law, all the way to the legal department within IBM Europe, more precisely Vienna. Listen why he chose to study abroad during his bachelor's and what this meant to his future. What are the differences in between big law, boutique firms and international companies, as well some do's and don'ts on topics such as networking, mentorship, and general advice for students and young professionals. Enjoy. Hello, Michael. Thanks so much for for joining my podcast. Um, Before diving into details, let's um, give the listeners a short sum of your bio. That would be a great place to start off this episode. Okay. All right. Uh, well, th- thank you for having me, <laughs> and uh, hello to all the all the listeners out there. Um, maybe a little bit about me uh, personally. I'm, uh, as you probably can hear from my accent, I'm American, uh, New Yorker, but I've been living in in Europe for 25 years. That comes from the fact that both my parents have very strong connections to Europe. Uh, my mother in particular, uh, with uh, family in Germany and in Italy. So we always had a very strong connection to our relatives uh, in in Europe. And that meant coming over to Europe quite a lot, uh, learning the language, in this case, German. Unfortunately, I I didn't learn Italian. That's on my list of things to do. Uh, But yes, so the the kind of interest in Europe started and, and I'll explain later why that's relevant to my career, my education, but it certainly had uh, a big impact on 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 both of those, and I mean, you know, personally. But uh, in terms of bio, I um, went uh, when I started studying. I I went to Washington, D.C. I uh, I went to George Washington University. Originally, the plan was to go into the Foreign Service into the diplomacy. So I studied international affairs. Washington was an amazing place to be at the time. Uh, I don't know, I doubt this is still the case, (laughs) but as a young student at the time, you could do things like you got invited. I got invited to Ronald Reagan's, and now I'm dating myself. (laughs) Well, anyway, Ronald Reagan's birthday party and fundraiser events uh, where, you know, uh, at the time, Vice President George Bush was at. So it was an amazing place in the early 80s to be a young student because you you had the ability to come in close contact with amazingly powerful, uh, fascinating people. And uh, I took full advantage of that. I I enjoyed my time in in Washington. And then, I did something that you know, uh, because we've talked about it before in the context of um, of your uh, studies abroad. I did something at the time which was unheard of. In, in the middle of studying at George Washington, <laughs> I, I got up and told my professors that I was leaving to Europe to do a year abroad, which at the time nobody did. There was no, there was really no infrastructure for it. Um, they all warned me that there would be no way of converting uh, credits that I would, and by the way, there was no concept of credits in, in the German system. Basically, they told me it would be a wasted year and that I would fail and that um, my language ability would not be strong enough to study. Uh, I have to say it was, I was quite cocky and confident and it was uh, not as easy <laughs> as I would have thought. Uh, but it was the best experience of my life. Um, and I know, you know, talking to younger people like yourself, that, um, you know, a year abroad, whether, you know, for Europeans, Erasmus, um, or, or anything like that, I can only say it was, if I made one definitive move in my career that I think really impacted my, my chances of being successful and my, my chances of having the career that I always wanted, it was that. It was uh, having the courage to break away from the system, try studying in a foreign country uh, without any safe safety net, and then coming back and trying to sell sell uh, my studies abroad to the authorities at the university and trying 
trying to get credit for it, which I ultimately did. And I graduated on time. I then went back to New York because quite frankly, I never really warmed up to Washington as a city and went back to New York, studied at Columbia University, got my Juris Doctorate. And um, well, in any event, I, I, I did numerous studies and in different places, partly in, in, in the United States, partly in Europe, and then no surprise, uh, started in uh, very, very large law firms that specialized in international clients. Uh, and because of my language ability, I was used a lot on German deals. And um, that led me, I, well, let me tell you a little bit about that. So I, I, since my original dream had been to go into the foreign service, I never gave up the, 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 the desire to work and live in a foreign country. And at the time I joined a law firm, uh, which was a, a very, very, very old law firm started by brothers, French brothers during the French revolution. Uh, they were called uh, Couder Frères, uh, Couder Brothers. And uh, one of the brothers went to New York, one stayed in Paris and one I think went to London. And it was the world's oldest international law firm. Uh, it was a very, very posh, <laughs> uh, place where you had uh, super, super amazingly intelligent people. Um, and uh, well, the, the uh, that was based in New York. Okay. And then I had the opportunity by meeting some partners uh, that were uh, working uh, that were Austrian and working in, in Eastern Europe, because this was just the time when the, the wall was had fallen an enormous amount of investment were going into Eastern Europe, particularly in Hungary and Czech Republic. Then I moved to Europe, okay. ended up uh, doing really very, very interesting deals as an extremely young lawyer. I have to say at, at, at a large law firm of a young lawyer, uh, and I, you know, let's say I, I, I got my JD, I must have been uh, 25 years old. So uh, at 25, 26, you would be doing little baby work at a large law firm, <laughs> checking, checking that a contract didn't have misspelled words, that the, that the references in the contract were correct. And here I was, 26 years old, running around, closing me, you know, multi-million dollar project financing agreements all throughout Europe. So it was an amazing experience. And it ultimately led, as I said, to me wanting to stay and work in Europe. And that's where I am now. Currently, I'm uh, I'm I'm st still I'm in Vienna, so it also explains why I'm in Vienna. I am I'm no longer in private practice. Uh, some years back, I decided to move from private practice from a private practice attorney from a law firm into a company. And if you want, I can explain the advantages and disadvantages of that later. And now work at uh, IBM, which I think is. Pretty well known, so I don't need to <laughs> explain what we do. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, please go ahead. I focus on our business consulting unit, which is, um, I think, the most interesting of all the the, the branches of IBM. It's 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 the the for the most part, it's it comes about when we brought when we bought Price Waterhouse, and and um and the consultants and the partners of Price Waterhouse uh, came over to IBM. And they're a brilliant group of uh, very ambitious, smart, client-oriented people. And it's a fascinating practice. Um, they do um, you know, really amazingly transformative work with clients, digitalizing clients, bringing them over to, uh, to the cloud, all sorts of different um, you know, um, IT plays that uh, um, really take a lot of negotiation from the legal point of view and a lot of consideration of potential legal issues. We're dealing with extremely sophisticated clients, uh, large banks, governmental entities, uh, insurance companies, telecommunication companies, I, you know, basically all the big players. So the legal issues are sufficient to keep me busy. And uh, I have a very large, capable, competent team throughout Europe and the Middle East and Africa, who um, I really rely on to do uh, uh, a lot of the groundwork. Um, and they're, uh, 
They're an amazing group of people and we have a great team, great teamwork. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's basically where I am now. Right, cool. So you're in the most uh, livable city in the world. <laughs> if it's still the case, I don't remember. Um, all right, Michael, so great stuff. Um, let's start all the way back with your studies. And I'm interested in the Washington um, period when you mentioned this, you went abroad. You've been mentioning how, what a big impact it had on you, upon your career or maybe your own personal life. So I'm interested, why did you want to do that? Did you have maybe your colleagues who had the same, the same intuition to, to just go abroad or maybe they, they even had exchanges, but within US, so maybe from Washington, they went on the, on the West Coast, they went to California maybe, or you even had colleagues who just like you wanted to, okay, let's go to Europe because maybe Europe was a sexy thing for, for people from the States back then. How was it like? What, what was your thought process at the time? Um, as, as I said, it was amazingly unusual, uh, <laughs> okay. almost, to the, almost to the point of being considered crazy. Uh, it, uh, everyone thought that I would ruin my chances of graduating on time. Okay. And I have to say, it was very, very difficult to graduate on time. I had to do all sorts of courses in the summer to make, because a lot of this was not accepted by the uh, American University. I have to say quite unfairly, uh, for example, when I came back and I, I was very, very um, aware and, and, and very diligent about taking the courses with the same course names that I was supposed to be taking in the United States with the naive belief that that would allow me to get the credit. So for example, I had a class called the history of Europe And the course that I would have had to have had taken in the United States was uh, European history. Now <laughs> you would think that, that uh, they refused to give me credit for that because they didn't know the quality of being taught history of Europe in Europe and assumed of course it was better being taught European history in the United States. So it, it was a lot of what I have to say unfair um, Uh, reaction. I, th I think this was because at the time, univer oh, no, not at the time, universities make money, they're a business, they, and they're in the United States an incredibly expensive business. Um, and they certainly didn't want people disappearing and going abroad <laughs> and, and getting credit for that and then not paying them. Anyway, long story short, I, I ended up getting uh, all the credit I needed by doing summertime courses Um, but um, to answer your question, I, 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 I was alone when I did it. Um, it was um, the most nerve wracking thing I've ever done. I think I was, I was nine. Uh, yeah, I had just turned 19. I was completely terrified. I got on that plane. I didn't know what to expect. And I can tell you in 1984, the difference between America and Europe was huge. Now in you know, 2021, the differences are subtle. In, in 1984, it, it, it looked, it, it, it felt, it tasted, it smelled it, completely different. Um, it was a, every minor little thing was a cultural shock. The way the telephones worked, the way you bought food, the way you interacted with people. I, I could go, and I, I think the first, month I, I was in shell shock. Um, but it allowed me to become, I think, a much more tolerant, open-minded person, open to change, even if it's frightening change like that, being, you know, a nine, little 19-year-old being completely alone uh, in a foreign country and uh, not understanding how anything works, and somehow just saying, well, I'm going to make it happen, and going to the university and finding out how you how you uh, matriculate, uh, finding where you buy the books and, you know, whatever. Uh, and like I said, I mean, a completely different world. Uh, even, you know, you had to, uh, at the time, I think I brought over uh, traveler's checks. But, you know, obviously there was no bank machines. There were, you couldn't, <laughs> it was very hard to bring over wire money or anything like that. So you, um, anyway, 
the long the long and the short of it is it uh, I, I did it alone it was an it was incredibly incredible experience it started off uh, very very difficult but by the end I didn't want to leave I had met so many friends and my German had gotten uh, you know at that point uh, almost to fluency um, and uh, which then later on became a huge asset that I was able to employ in um, private practice and then later on for IBM. Uh, cool. Uh, Michael, so you've mentioned this class history of Europe and I think, uh, yes, indeed, I mean, it might be different. I had this discussion with a friend, the history you learn about Europe, for example, in Europe, it might be different than the history Americans are thought about Europe. <laughs> and I think it's the same uh, me as I'm coming from Eastern Europe. I might learn a uh, different version of the history of even my country than, than people from here are being taught in school. So I think this is quite quite a nice um, not nice point. But nevertheless, I think living abroad when you are young, it's a life hack. And I don't know, maybe nowadays the subject is way more popular than back back in the days. But what would you recommend to students or young, uh, young uh, professionals right now? Would you encourage them to do the jump and go abroad for during your studies or maybe during just for some work experience? What's your, what's I, your I would advice? definitely, my advice on that is everybody who has the chance should go uh, away for an entire year. <laughs> for entire um, life. <laughs> <laughs> no, not an entire year. <laughs> or two, two, let's say two semesters and a summer, well, which is a year. I think you shouldn't wimp out by going. I know a lot of Americans, I, you know, using this phrase wimp out, but they go, they go to Ireland or England, which I really think, of course, you know, there are reasons where that may, may be a good idea, but I think most you people should be courageous in their choice and pick countries um, where they really can be challenged um, from a cultural perspective, from a linguistical perspective, and can really get much more out of the experience. I know uh, a young uh, cousin of mine uh, did her year abroad, uh, which as, as you know, now it's quite easy and it's, it's almost assumed people will do it, uh, but she did hers in Trinity College in Dublin. And, Quite frankly, the, the, there are not huge cultural differences between Ireland and the United States. There certainly are very little in the way of linguistical differences. So uh, as nice as the experience was, I think she could have gotten a lot more out of it had she gone to a country um, you know, that was a little bit more challenging. All right, cool. Mm, so you went back. You, you did your studies abroad in, uh, in Germany came back in the States and started. So did you have any work experience in between Washington and um, Columbia period, or did you just um, went back directly into the studies uh, at the Columbia, um, Columbia University? How was it? I had to pay for my study myself. So I, uh, I took every kind of grueling, uh, demeaning job I could from, from working in amusement parks in the laundry department, to uh, you know, I I I I won't impress you by talking about <laughs> the talks that I did. I I other than other than you know I I I think it, in a way those blue collar jobs that I took, whether they were you know of whatever nature, you know you also learn from those, and of um, course. Uh, you also come in con contact with people you you know, would, would not necessarily come in contact if you, you know, always stay at, at, at all these nice fancy schools and then you go to a nice fancy law firm and, uh, you know, you're not really exposed to people who live very, very, very different lives than you. And uh, so, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't talk about any of the jobs I did in that period before I, I went to Colombia as being, uh, objectively speaking, uh -huh. uh, interesting. But um, subjectively, I got a lot out of them, um, you know, and uh, I realized the importance of, of education and uh, uh, because, uh, you know, standing on your feet eight, 10 hours a day, um, getting night shifts, working all night, 
you know, I, it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, and, and for very low pay. Uh, uh, so I have to say, you know, for a student where you're, you know, you're mixing that with academic scholarships and, you know, whatever you can to, to make your way through university, it's fine. Um, and it does make you appreciate later on in life when you uh, are able to uh, get a job that's more intellectually challenging. And frankly, that, that pays more. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no doubt in that, Michael. I just wanted to 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 find out if it's the the Columbia um, period. It's like a continuation as in Europe. You have your bachelor, then you have your your masters. Um, so, how was it like in terms of timeline? You finished the Washington, your studies in <laughs> international yeah. affairs. Then you went uh, straight. So while to you're uh, so this. I'm sorry, there's a little bit of a lag between us. Um, I'm not interrupting, it's just you're, uh, we, I cut yeah. you off um, inadvertently. A, the American system is uh, you cannot study law uh, right after high school. You have to have a uh, um, either a bachelor's or a master's in, in, uh, in a subject, and then you can apply um, for the JD program. In fact, at Columbia, uh, the, the vast majority of people, I was, I think, one of the youngest in my class, the vast majority of people had master's degrees in different, sub, usually political science or history. Um, and many, many, many people had worked uh, a number of years. So I was really a baby in that class because um, I had gone straight from, uh, straight from my bachelor's to, uh, to law school. And what happens, the system in the United States is, I guess it's your junior year. Michael, just to, just to jump in. So maybe in Europe you have, it's the same thing as an NBA where you, you, where you need your, for example, bachelor and you need some work experience before jumping, jumping into an NBA. But instead of having like a business degree, you just have a law more, uh, degree. And it's gonna be of course more tougher, a longer period of time and, uh, and so on. As an European, I can think as a, the law studies, the same thing as an NBA in Europe. Does it make sense? Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're similar because, I mean, obviously, the United States also has MBAs. It, it's, it's a similar concept. It's just uh, obviously a longer study. And um, I don't know the rules on an MBA if, you need, if your bachelor's needs to also be in business administration. Oh, yeah. uh, probably not. And I'm sure it's, 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 it's flexible. Uh, but yeah, no, I think I think it's uh, it's an it's an analogous kind of thing. It's just that you're studying something different, and uh, and the study is is longer. But in the American system, so when you're getting uh, so to get it, you take you take something called the LSATs, right. um, which is uh, uh, you know I know there's a comparable thing for a master's pro MBA, and uh, depending how how well you do on that with your grades. Uh, can determine um, what law school you, and I applied to. Uh, I applied to uh, mostly the Ivy League law law schools. Not all the Ivy League schools have law schools, but I applied to um, Harvard, Columbia. Um, well, anyway, you know, Cornell. <laughs> that, the rest it doesn't matter. <laughs> Columbia, and, Harvard. <laughs> and, uh, I I actually got waitlisted from Harvard um, and then got eventually got in. But at that point, I had my heart set on Columbia. Uh, I also had great uh, academic um, scholarship. Uh, so so the financial aid was great, um, which, like I said, in my case was important because I was financing it myself. And then I moved uh, from Washington, got a little apartment on campus. At Columbia, one at one West 116th Street, overlooking Morningside Park, and I don't know, you know, if you've if you or any of your listeners have ever seen Columbia, or for that matter, any of the Ivy League universities like Princeton and and Yale and Harvard, uh, they're they're gorgeous. They're architecturally beautiful places. Museums, <laughs> very nice place to study. Um, you know, these are ancient institute, ancient, I mean, they're hundreds of, hundreds of years old, uh, and for America, that's ancient. Uh, I have to make sure, realize that I'm speaking to an international <laughs> group of people that would not, of course, be ancient in the Egyptian sense of the word, uh, but, but very, very, very old, prestigious 
institutions um, where they've had a lot of money, obviously, because their alumni have gone on to bigger and better things and have donated enormous amounts. I'm not sure if Columbia or Harvard are one of the richest institutions in the world. It's something I one time looked, it's uh, some of these universities have amassed such enormous fortunes as a result of um, con contributions from their alumni. But anyway, yeah. And then I was in New York City and took advantage of that to start doing part-time work that was more in line with my studies and not working in a laundry, washing dirty shirts. No. Um, so I was able to work uh, a whole host of things, including legal aid societies, uh, law firms. And it was a time when Wall Street was booming. So the Wall, so the Wall Street firms and the Park Avenue firms were very, very, very eager to get um, law students from, from the prestigious law firms mm -hmm. and were taking you to opera and, and, and inviting you to trips. And so you were being wooed uh, like you were a, you know, a young actor who was being, you know, many movie studios were trying to get you to join, to sign the contract. So it was, uh, it, was, it was an amazing experience to be in your early 20s and have all these huge prestigious law firms fighting over you and promising you, you know, all sorts of great experiences and trips and, uh, you know, whatever. But, uh, I, you know, I concentrated on my studies, obviously. I graduated at the, at the top of my class and I was very happy about that. Yeah, and then and then had to make a decision, which was, in my case, not too difficult, uh, because I always was interested in uh, an international job, and more with a focus on Europe as opposed to um, South America or Asia, and uh, yeah, and then started at Kudair Brothers. All right. So as a student, I should say first as a student, and then of course afterwards I graduated, and then after you graduate, you have to study for the bar exam where you're admitted, uh, so it's a separate, has nothing to do with the university. It's a state exam um, that you have to pass in order to become a uh, practicing attorney uh, in the state where you passed it. I, I obviously, I, well, not obviously, but I did mine in, in New York uh, because I planned on staying in New York. So I passed the New York bar exam and was became admitted to the New York bar in uh, 1990 and then started as a young associate at uh, on this uh, at this large law firm. All right, you've done well in your exams, your studies. You were saying that companies were fighting over over graduates. You had even so you did you did an internship, let's call it like that, during the, the during your studies. You passed the exam, and then you you were uh, an associate for the company. How was it like being an associate for uh, for a law? Law firm. Tell me a bit about that. <laughs> it's that's a very good question. So when you're a summer intern, all they do is wine and dine you, and <laughs> they do things like they'll send you to Hong Kong for the weekend to to to, you know. I mean, they were. I've never seen such a you know generous treatment of young students. Um, we, we all naively thought that life would be that way for the rest of our time at the law firm. Uh, we all signed our permanent employment contracts and then realized that life as a first year associate is, uh, is grueling, it's demanding. <laughs> uh, you're dealing with people who, uh, I don't know if you know that TV show Suits, but that, um, that one partner um, uh, that, that likes to torture the associates, okay, Lewis. Uh, that that unfortunately is a reality. There were there's a Lewis in every law firm, and uh, so we were, we although we at the time I, I remember the starting salary was just freakishly high. It was so out of proportion with what other people were making. Uh, but if, you know, in my case, I didn't get. I I still had to starve myself because I had enormous student loans to pay back. But. Um, they, they definitely tortured you for that money and you work long hours. But I have to say, it's the best education you can get to become a legal professional. 
I recommend to everybody, if you are, if you do go into the legal field, you know, obviously try to get into the best law school that you can, but getting a job at a large law firm where you're um, exposed to uh, enormous projects, very, very uh, intellectual uh, colleagues, tight uh, timelines and all of that, that really molds you as a young professional in a way that university studies could never do. And um, I, I, I have to say for me, from a later on in my life, as I became a, you know, a, a, a lawyer in smaller law firms or companies, uh, I always look back at those grueling years as a young associate, you know, not going to bed one time, I think two, two days in a row, we were working on a deal. The camaraderie we were able to build up, uh, the fact that humor, you should never lose your humor, the attention to detail and, uh, and the importance of doing your absolute best work, even if, even if it was just to make sure the contracts, you know, didn't have false references in them or whatever it was. Um, all those things, all those, all the skills that I learned at a large law firm, I think uh, it, it's it's irreplaceable and it's something that 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 people, you know, if they are pursuing a career in the law. They should definitely um, take advantage, if they can, of working in a large law firm. So, right. Speaking of, my question is: What skills would would someone need to to succeed in a in a in, in a such environment? You know, in a law in a law firm. Is it something you can you can be taught in school, or is it uh, something you picked up along the way? Uh, I don't know. That's a very good question. I, I mean, clearly when you, the skills you learn in, in university, how to, um, how to write well, uh, how to employ analytical thinking, um, how to, in, in this case, how to apply the law are invaluable. I mean, the, the, those, are the, the, those are basics that you absolutely need. What you learn in the law firm though is, uh, well, first of all, you, you continue to increase your, your legal skills because then you apply theory to reality. Right. Um, and uh, in a law firm, as a young associate, you spend horribly long time in the, in the law library. I don't know if they still <laughs> do this, but, <clears throat> but in our day, you actually, you spend hours and hours and hours, weekends and holidays, with stacks of books, reading and reading and reading to, to come up with a case that could help your client. And then you wrote a memorandum that the partner would rip apart and you'd have to do it again. And so the, it, so, so the, the skills you learned in terms of applying um, the theoretical law to reality, um, into articulating it in a manner which a client could, uh, that could be helpful for a client, that's an uh, you know um and also finally how to deal in an extremely competitive environment i think uh so many people when put in a, an env a highly competitive environment where a lot of money is at stake um i think partners in large law firms you know make millions and millions of dollars a year so there's a lot of competition but how to deal with that competition how to still be collegial to to your to your colleagues, how to keep your sense of humor, how to keep your work-life balance. All of those skills uh, are also important. And those are, those are also things that you, you learn uh, in that sort of uh, milieu. Right. Um, so you've been mentioning after your year abroad during your studies, the language became an asset, um, speaking of German, German language. So I assume it helped you a lot during your, your, your career. When, so when the change, when did the change happen from New York uh, moving to, to, to Europe? So we, I was working at this law firm and a partner from a large law firm, a very similar law firm. It was started during the uh, monarchy days. I think the, the founder of the law firm was the Hof Advocat, the, the, the uh, I guess you'd call it sort of a Queen's Council or King's Council or Emperor's Council, um, and he and it was a very old, prestigious law firm um, where most of the partners came from uh, old aristocratic Austrian families, and the uh, 
focus at the time was on Eastern Europe, um, where Austria was uniquely positioned uh, because of its, con its historical connections to Eastern Europe, its geographic uh, proximity to, to Eastern Europe. We're only about 50 minute, 45 minute car ride away from the Slovakian border, for example. So uh, this partner who was visiting the New York law firm said, you know, we were speaking German, obviously, and he said, you know, if you ever want to come and work <laughs> in Vienna, Austria, Say no more. Uh, I said, all right, I'll be there in May. And I, uh, a few months later, again, not knowing anybody, jumped on a plane, came to Vienna. Um, luckily, they had found me in an apartment, so that part was done. Uh, and then, uh, and then said to myself, "This is, this is where I want to stay. This is really a beautiful, very a uh, high a city with very high Lebens uh, Lebensqualität in German life quality of life." And uh, like I said, the 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 chance as a young lawyer to do major deals by myself all over the all over you know uh, Eastern Europe. And I got to such beautiful cities like Bucharest um, and, uh, you know, uh, Prague and, and, and Budapest, uh, Zagreb. Uh, it, uh, it was an amazingly challenging and a stimulating experience because unlike the large law firm days where you um, were under enormous pressure and there was a lot of competition, working alone in these sort of exotic locations didn't have all that but of course you had to be you were working alone so you were if you made a mistake there was no one there to catch it and the clients were looking to you to to help them so it had pressure of a different sort um but i found it even though you risked making huge mistakes and because you know let's face it i was young and didn't have any experience um, and working in a jurisdiction where I never studied, by the way, um, you know, I'm not a Czech lawyer, I'm not a Slovak lawyer, um, you know, so, it, uh, but at the time when the, when the wall had fallen, the legal systems in these countries were, was in such uh, a state of unclarity that uh, it didn't really even, matter. Even nowadays, we, <laughs> we, even nowadays, we might have the same, uh, the same situation. Um, all right, Michael, so... Give me some hints, some some highlights on about the move. How how was it like in terms of yeah maybe in terms of professional life? It was you had more pressure on your shoulders. You were making these big deals, but in terms of I would say quality of life, or maybe you've noticed some differences, cultural um, differences in between your peers, in between your clients. Uh, how was it like moving from from the states? Um, to to Europe, um, particularly to Vienna, which uh, back at the time it was a, a, a unique uh, unique selling point. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say, I think the, the to use your term, selling point for Vienna was uh, uh, one. There was a much more there was a healthier work life balance. So we had one or two people who were extreme, but no matter how extreme they were in their 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 work ethic, they were nothing, nothing as uh, like in a large New York law firm. So the work life people in, had families or, 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 you know, partners, they, they went on vacations, they spent time with their family. Um, they, you know, they rarely uh, worked seven days a week. So it was a much more normal, healthier, uh, uh, sort of way, and and Vienna itself, of course, is a much more laid back city at the time, and well, it still is the case that everything is closed on Sunday, and at the time on Saturday, uh, everything closed. I think at noon. Uh, so uh, so that meant that uh, you know you 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 had to leave work early to go food shopping, or it wasn't something you could wait to the weekend. Uh, um, you know, unless you, as I did many, many times, show up at the supermarket at 11.15, hoping to do a whole week's worth of shopping in 45 <laughs> minutes. Um, but uh, yeah, the work, and I found the colleagues, um, maybe because I was the, the sort of little um, American in the group, they treated me so nicely. And uh, they were, every single one of them 
ensured that I came over their house, took me on like weekend trips to see different parts of Austria. I guess I was sort of a novelty for them, uh, German speaking uh, and American. And uh, they, they all, all, all without exception took me under their wing. And of course that made me fall in love with the country that much more because people were so nice to me. Um, and, the, and then that interest and love for, for different cultures spread as I started doing work in Eastern Europe. As you know, I mean, I have had wonderful experiences in Romania. You and I have talked about it. I'm I, I, a particular big fan of the food uh, and, and the beautiful architecture of Transylvania um, and the landscape of the Duna Delta. So, I mean, the, the uh, and I mention this because even though it's not career oriented per se, clearly these are benefits of having an international job uh, that you get to develop as a person, you get to visit uh, places you, you normally normally would never visit. You get to have friends all over the world uh, and learn from them, a different perspective. You become a much more tolerant, open-minded person. So I think, you know, to again, to use your phrase selling point, I think the selling point is so much broader than the what you would identify at first glance in terms of the work because there are all different layers that build on top of that. You know, the people, uh, the learning a different culture, the ability to travel, and quite frankly, and, and you know this as well, when you are a foreigner living in a, in a um, you know, when, when foreigner living in a different country, every day is a learning experience, whether you, you learn some words or a cultural thing or, and, uh, and I think that gets quite addicting after a while to be uh, to to have that that benefit of just by living in a country you get to learn and grow, um, and uh, yeah, so that's yeah. how. I you're right. I, I said it many times. It's it's like a um, life hack. Um, all right, I have a question here, Michael. So this company in Vienna, it's uh, so it's not a larger company; it's a smaller company. Can we call it like a boutique company? It, uh, you mean the law firm? Yes, exactly. The, yeah. the, the law firm. Do you have the uh, same terms uh, as a boutique uh, firm? No, or? no. It was. It was definitely. I think that's a the brilliant uh, choice of words. That's exactly what it was. Okay. Um, exactly. It was a boutique law firm that specialized in uh, specialized in Eastern Europe. They were. Uh, they immediately opened up offices in Bratislava, Prague, Budapest before I. I don't want to say they were the first to do it, but they were one of the first to do it in all those cities, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a boutique law firm, but uh, because they were so specialized and because they had such an enormously strong reputation with regard to Eastern Europe, they were subsequently bought by a large international uh, law firm called DLA Piper. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, they went from going to a boutique law firm <laughs> to being yeah. a part of a uh, chain, which, by the way, I think is a normal development. Yeah, of course, it's it, it's organic to 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 happen. Um, I'm interested here. So yes, your your background it's quite fascinating. So from a from a big law firm, you went to a boutique, uh, of course, a different location. So what would be the main differences in between working within a large firm and a boutique? If we have some students to, at a law school, what should they expect working in a, being an associate, for example, in a, in a large firm uh, on one side and on the other side, having this boutique uh, boutique firm, what would be the main differences? So um, I'll do the advantages, disadvantages. A large <laughs> law firm, uh, generally speaking, pays top salaries. Um, okay, let's go for that. <laughs> let's go with that. <laughs> So that might that might end the decision for most young students. Uh, it, it certainly ended the decision for me because I had a lot of student loans to pay back. But um, so a large law firm has 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 usually much more impressive uh, compensation. Uh, they're also much more prestigious to have on your resume, and I think it's key. So I would never go to straight off to a boutique. I think going to a large law firm at the beginning, getting the stamp of approval. Right. that you can use for the rest of your life because yeah, yeah. if you were associate with a law firm that everybody knows, then they know you can't be that bad. 
So if you went to a, a well-known law school and then you went to a well-known law firm, it's a sort of passport for the rest of your career because people say, well, you know, that's, like I said, this person can't be that bad if they, if they did that. You also um, have the advantages at a large law firm to go into all different departments. So they'll put you in the litigation department. They'll put you, so you spend a couple months in each department and you get to really get a flavor for all different types of the legal practice, which is the one that you enjoy the most. Do you enjoy more courtroom work? Do you enjoy, you know, more intellectual work like tax law, uh, you know, et cetera. And you also, uh, generally speaking, deal with, well-known clients at a large law firm, clients that everybody knows. And there's a certain, and, and, and then finally, of course, for people networking, uh, you're exposed to, you know, a really impressive group of colleagues, of clients. So you're, you're able to, to network yourself at an amazingly high level. Now, a boutique law firm, again, I think as, a, as a, later on in your career uh, is probably the way to go. You're able to work much more independently, have much more client contact, which is much more rewarding. A, in a large law firm, you may never speak to the client. You might be just doing your research in a library. Nobody sees you. You write your little uh, legal opinions that nobody will read. And, and you're like a little clerk. Uh, you know, I, I'm, say, I'm speaking you know, at the beginning. Whereas at a boutique law firm, which is by definition smaller, they will put you on deals where you have client contact. Uh, you'll, you'll lead deals by yourself. And in this case, because it was a boutique international law firm, I was able to travel almost every week or every other week. So I was constantly going to foreign countries. And uh, I did not, have, did not have that ability at a large law firm because those, you know, usually it was the partners or the more senior lawyers who uh, had the advantage of traveling and meeting clients. All right. And I, it would be correct to assume that's the case in pretty much every industry out there, be it finance, be it uh, technology. You, you'll be better off starting with a big company, with a big brand and, and so on. And then, yeah, you can specialize in going in, into a boutique. And um, I'm a big fan of that. Um, all right. So jumping from a, from a, a large firm to a boutique and now to a company, which is a tech company. So I would say you follow the I, I don't know if it's quite normal uh, along your, your peers to do that. Why did you jump off from a boutique uh, into, or maybe you had another step in between the boutique company and IBM, or it was directly? I went to another it... boutique firm, uh, oh. which was a New York law firm that specialized in German speaking clients. And uh, so, so, I, so I large law firm, two boutique firms, and then I made the jump to, the, uh, to a company. I should say in the old days, uh, none of, you know, even, let's say I was the last generation that maybe felt this, but it, if you, it, I hate to phrase it like this, but real lawyers worked at law firms. And uh, there was a, there was a prejudice against working as an in-house lawyer. And I, I was reluctant to, to leave private legal practice, not only because the compensation you know, is, is uh, you know, generally speaking, much better. Um, I just, I just thought if you, I just thought it would be a more rewarding career in, as a, in a private practice attorney. I could not have been more wrong. I, I got the job at IBM because my best friend um, uh, was working here. He had made the jump from a very prestigious law firm. So that made me feel a lot better. And he, he kept, arguing for me to come over, come over. And uh, strangely enough, they were looking for a law, an American lawyer who had studied in Europe and had extensive experience in Eastern Europe. Uh, and he put up his hand and said, I know somebody who has, oh yeah, right. I know somebody who has that experience. And they wanted the person to move to Vienna. <laughs> so <laughs> it, 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 was, uh, it was as if the, the, the opportunity had been created especially for me. And so the um, head of the, of, uh, the uh, EMEA law department, a very, very brilliant, hardworking, uh, somebody I've, I've respected uh, my whole life, uh, 
called me, uh, woke me up at seven in the morning and said, we want you on a plane here tomorrow. I had no idea what this was all about. That my, uh, you know, he explained that they, that my best friend had recommended me and they were looking for somebody just like me. And uh, anyway, so I, 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 I wish I could tell you I had the foresight of thinking that a career in IT 20 years ago uh, was the way to go. Uh, I wish I could tell you that, uh, you know, a lot of things. I can only tell you that I, uh, it was the fact that I got a chance to come back to Vienna, which I was really high on my agenda, um, and that my best friend was working here and that they had a job which uniquely captured all of my, let's say, character, uh, all of my skill set. Um, so I was very excited by that chance. Uh, long story short, because uh, I, I realized we're running out of time, I took the job, flew to Austria, moved once again, and started off as just a little country council. Um, I think I was just, uh, originally started, I was the, the lawyer for, for Egypt, um, and then for, uh, that I added Hungary. So then next thing I knew, I was regional council of 26 countries, and, uh, and the fun never stopped. I was, I, I, I've been all over from Dubai to Johannesburg, to Shanghai, to uh, Moscow for, for, I've done everything from transactional work to litigation, to criminal law, to um, IP disputes, you name it. And, and you know, I can tell you that uh, the biggest joy of working for a company is that you're in you're you're the uh, the consigliere, so to speak. You're the, the you're you're the trusted advisor of the business. And if you really enjoy your job, like I do, you get involved heavily involved in the business. Understand their direction, understand their goals, understand their strategy, and you ensure that from a legal point of view that you're supporting them and achieving that in a way that's uh, that's not only obviously legal but also ethical and moral. But many times my advice is, is purely common sense because I'm coming at it from a complete different point of view as my business colleagues. I have no, I have no uh, clients that I need. I have no business targets. I can be very, very neutral and objective. Michael, before ending this, this, um, this discussion, just if you'd have to... Um give a, a piece of advice for students or for young professionals out there, what would, uh, what would it be? Of course, in terms of, of uh, professional life. I, I would say never say no to opportunities to study and work in different countries. <laughs> if anything, my biggest mistake was that I didn't do more of that. I had opportunities to more move to that. China <laughs> and I had opportunities to move to Dubai. And uh, I really wish... I had uh, uh, because I had stayed as mobile as I was when I was younger. So I would say um, all the young people out there go study in different countries, spend time learning different languages, perfect your your foreign languages, uh, because obviously being able to order something in a restaurant is not the same as being able to function in a business environment. Build a strong set of friends and colleagues that you continuously keep contact with your whole career, they're an invaluable asset later on for your career that a friend calls you and says, I have a job that's made for you. That's the way Point. real career careers are made. Don't be shy to, to in mentoring people, oh. even if you can't see any benefit. Get out there. I mentor an enormous group of people. I take it very, very seriously. Some people internally, some people externally, some people in the legal field, some people not. Um, I, I find it's, first of all, I think it's the right thing to do. Second of all, you have enormous amount to bring to people. And you as a mentor also get a lot back from, from, from these uh, relationships. So uh, get a, you know, for young people, definitely get a good mentor. I think that's, that's very, very, very important. Get out there, get known, and don't be afraid to take risks. Love it, uh, love it, Michael. You, you touched uh, subjects as networking mentors, which I had it on my agenda, so it's it's quite quite uh, quite uh, excellent. Um, loved it, so we can we can leave it to that. And um, 
Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks again. Thanks for, uh, again for the, sure, for the discussion. Thank you for taking the time. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Michael.